Uh, we are in the season of Lent. Every year at New Life, we observe this season. We observe the season of Advent, Lent, uh, Easter tide. It's our way of being oriented around the church calendar, what churches around the world throughout the ages have oriented their formation in life in Christ. And next week, we're going to officially begin a sermon series uh, on repentance as a theme for Lent is one of the running core themes through the season of Lent. As we prepare, as we look forward towards Good Friday, as we prepare for Easter, it's essentially creating that space within us to encounter the risen Jesus when he comes in his power. And so next week I'll begin a series along those lines. But it's really a thrill to introduce our guest speaker today. In the world of um, pastors and preachers, there are certain names uh, that come up over and over and over in different settings on social media, through friends, you hear about different conferences, what have you. And over the years, uh, Pastor Brian Loritz's name has been one of those names that have come up over and over and over. Uh, as a preacher, I'm always looking for other preachers that I can be learning from and growing from. And while I'm washing dishes, I can just put on YouTube and listen to a preacher. Uh, Brian Loritz is one of those preachers. Uh, pastor Brian is the lead pastor of Abundant Life Christian Fellowship in Mountain View, California. He's the co-founder of Fellowship Memphis Church, uh, where he serves as the lead pastor of this multi-ethnic church for 11 years, helping the church to grow from 26 people in his living room uh, to several thousand. He's the president of uh, the Kainos Movement, an organization aimed at establishing the multi-ethnic church in America as uh, the new normal, apart from kind of the segregated kind of mentality in churches that we see rampant around our country. Uh, he's the husband of, of Corey and proud father of three boys, Quentin Miles. Miles is playing video games downstairs with the middle school kids in our lower level. He came with him on the, on the trip here. And Jaden. And uh, Brian was with us yesterday at our racial reconciliation gathering, which was phenomenal. It was powerful. We'll have the main sessions uh, available online sometime soon. And uh, he really uh, blessed us profoundly uh, yesterday. And uh, he, we were selling his books yesterday, and there's, there's about um, five copies remaining uh, downstairs. He wrote a book called Saving the Saved. Amen. That's saving. God knows the saved sometimes need to be saved. And so how Jesus saves us from try harder Christianity and to performance free love. And so there are about five copies left. I see people walking out right now to get the copies. Don't walk out yet. You know, just, and if you can't get it today, I know Jerry, she's not in the room. She said, don't go on Amazon. Go on Amazon and pick up his book. All right. And so, uh, don't tell Jerry I said that, all right? So, uh, listen, he's preached in New York City before, uh, but he's never preached in Queens, all right? And so, uh, we want, every time we get a guest speaker in here, we don't do like the little pitter-pat like, oh, we're glad you're here. I mean, we really extend uh, a, a, a form of hospitality with a really e e exuberant and warm welcome. And so... Let's give Brian the biggest Queens Boulevard welcome we can. Welcome, Brian the Ritz. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's great to see you. I uh, was glad when they said unto me, let us go to New Life Church. <laughs> Uh, it is so, so good to be here with you. Uh, I bring you greetings from Mountain View, California. I wish I could have brought you weather from Mountain View, <laughs> California. I don't know how you do it. And uh, my flight leaves here at 3.40 this afternoon. I'll get back to God's country. Um, so... <laughs> Um, while I'm poking fun and alienating you, let me just go ahead and say I apologize in advance for what my warriors are fitting to do, about to do to the Knicks, all right? Uh, uh, Y'all have had a rough year, I mean decade, I mean quarter century. Uh, anyways, God's blessed you with Phil Jackson, though. 
Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, what a joy it is to be here with you. Um, and uh, this is um, the third service, uh, and uh, uh, it's just an absolute, this is like a bucket list item. And I don't say this to flatter you, but I, I have long been a deep admirer of, um, of new life. In fact, when I kind of journeyed into uh, the world of multi-ethnic church planting, um, sadly to say at the time I looked around the uh, ecclesiological horizon and I didn't see uh, many great models of multi-ethnic churches, uh, but praise God for a new life. And so I have drunk deeply from the books that have been unleashed through this church and ministry and uh, from the lives of leaders uh, like Pete Scazzaro and your beloved pastor, lead pastor, Pastor Rich. And uh, I want you to know that this church is having a rippling effect for the kingdom throughout the world for the glory of God. And so, <laughs> praise God for what's happening here. Um, if you have your devices, please take them out. Don't click on your Pokemon Go apps, but click on your Bible apps and, uh, and meet me in James chapter 5. Um, I, I've always, whenever I go and preach different places, I, I don't want to just kind of take out one of the proverbial greatest hits and pop it in the microwave and give a warmed over word. Um, I, I really want to be prayerful and ask God for a word in season for this particular body. And so I was praying that, and uh, God says, surprise, surprise, I want you to give three different words to new life, uh, all centered around the theme of love. So we have been today in a series on love. And the first hour, we were, we were in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, really flying at a high altitude for what, what does love look like. Uh, and then last hour, uh, we were in Matthew chapter 18, looking at a face of love, which is forgiveness. And today, at this hour, I want to look at another face of love. Paul told the Corinthians that love, among many things, love is patient. So I know you've got this figured out. Uh, and if you've got it figured out, you can leave. But I want to preach on patience. I want to preach on patience. James chapter 5, pick me up in verse 7. James writes, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being Here's that word again, patient about it. Until it receives the early and the late rains, you also be patient. I think he's trying to make a point. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I love this. Underline this phrase, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained synonym for patience, steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen, make a note of this phrase, the purpose of the Lord how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Father, now speak to us through your word. My brothers and sisters do not need to hear the wandering thoughts of a 44-year-old man. They need to hear a timeless word from an eternal God. And so, Father, I, I kind of stand at this moment um, like the man in the parable of the seed and the sower, Matthew 13, scattering seed, the seed of your word. And I pray that the seed of your word would fall on good ground, good hearts, that it would take root and bear much fruit. I pray, Lord God, that you would put shoe leather on your word, that as a result of leaving today, hearing your word, that you would grow and groom us in this area to be more like you. 
to this end that I'm available to you, as the old African-American preachers used to say, stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my tongue, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One of the worst things that could ever happen to an oyster is to have lodged within its shells a teeny tiny grain of sand. Now normally when this happens, this oyster is readily able to locate this grain of sand and quickly remove or expel it from off of its premises and go on about the day's affairs. But now there are those rare moments, New Life, where Try as this oyster may, it just can't get rid of the grain of sand. It's in a situation it cannot change. It's in a circumstance that it cannot get out of. And when this happens, this oyster finds itself irritated, frustrated, exacerbated, in any other kind of unsanctified aided. (laughs) This oyster is about to lose its mind up in here, up in here, (laughs) to quote a 90s urban poet. (laughs) Some of y'all are lost, I know. (laughs) Here is this oyster. it can't get rid of this grain of sand. It's, it's going crazy. I'm in a situation, a circumstance. I cannot change. It's at this point where this oyster relies on one heck of a plan B. It's as if this oyster says, if I can't get rid of it, I might as well make the most of it. So it finds this grain of sand and it begins to coat it over and over and over again with a liquid substance that when it solidifies or calcifies, it turns into something, ladies, that you pay top dollar for, a pearl. You do know at the end of the day, all a pearl is, is the fruit of a very frustrated oyster. If there was no irritation, if there was no frustration, if there was no exacerbation, if there was no sense in which I cannot change my circumstance, if there was no grain of sand, there would be no pearl. God has sent me all the way from Silicon Valley to tell each and every one of you, no matter whether or not you are saved or unsaved, no matter where you fall on the spiritual continuum, if you have been made in the Imago Dei, the image of God, God has a desire for your life. He wants to make you a pearl of great price. If I was in a chocolate church, cue the Hammond B3 organ right now. We, we would be shouting and having some church. No R, some church. (laughs) Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship. Greek word for workmanship, poema, from which we get the English word poem from. We are God's workmanship. We are his masterpiece. Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that your mama and daddy may not have planned on you being here. Parenthetically, you know that's true. If your closest sibling is a decade older than you, you was a surprise. <laughs> the lady back there just got that. Really? I'm just starting to do the math. Here. <laughs> but while you may have been a surprise to your mom and daddy, you were not a surprise to the sovereign God. He created you on purpose and for a purpose, and he wants to lift you up as a pearl of great price. But now comes the un-American portion of the message, because our problem here in America is, while we love the destination a pearl, we say, make me a pearl, our problem is, we just don't want the process. 
There is no such thing as becoming a pearl without dealing with life's irritating, frustrating, exacerbating grains of sand. If I could mix my metaphors, I would say, new life, there is no such thing as getting to God's delivery room of blessings without first taking a pit stop in his waiting room called patience. If you were to peruse God's kitchen, you may be shocked to discover that in God's kitchen, there are no microwaves, only crock pots. So God says, Brian, I have an assignment on your life. You, you are here, but I want to get you, Brian, to a place of fall off the bone faith. So I've got to stick you in my crock pot, turn up the heat, and slow cook you. Brian, I am not ultimately concerned with your gifts, abilities, or competencies. In fact, one of the worst things God could ever do to you is to put you in a position where your gifts outpace your character. So God says, Brian, I've given you some gifts, some, some charismata. I have given you some spiritual gift, but now I've got to build the character infrastructure for you to support the gift. And that does not happen overnight. So I've got to put you in a situation where you, where you have to sit with some irritation. You have to sit with some frustration. You have to sit with some things that your PhD can't get you out of. Your MBA can't negotiate. Your, your social network can't solve. Your, 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 your bank account can't write the check for. There will be some things in life where all of us will go through that we can't get a quick fix. This, this ain't going to get solved by coming to the altar, one and done. You've got your breakthrough. Problem is over. That's not normally how it works. Every great man or woman of God in the scriptures whom God has ever used mightily has spent significant time in the crock pot. This is Joseph. 17-year-old, we, we meet him, 17-year-old, arrogant punk kid talk, talking to his brothers about how they're going to bow down. <laughs> Another veiled 90s urban poet hip-hop reference. <laughs> and yet 13 years later, this once arrogant man is now filled with humility as he tells his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for Amen. good. Amen. What changed him 13 years in the crock pot? 13 years being betrayed, lied on, forgotten about, crying himself to sleep. 13 years, God says, I'm just going to let you sit for 13 years. And here you are frustrated because it's been 13 weeks. <laughs> Here's Moses. Lives to be 120. His life fits neatly inside of three sections of 40. The first 40 years we know a lot about. He's the proverbial prince of Egypt. The last 40 years we know a lot about. He's the legendary liberator and lawgiver. It's those middle 40 years that we know hardly anything about. 40 years spent in anonymity. 40 years shepherding sheep on the dusty plains of Midian. 40 years, the equivalent of 1977 to 2017, wondering, God, where are you? Are my best days? behind me finally God shows up one day through a bush that is burning but is not being consumed and God says now you're ready I'm going to take every single lesson gleaned from every single day shepherding these animals these sheep you're now going to use that for your next assignment shepherding my people my sheep in God's economy there's no such thing as a wasted day or experience Patience. Did you know from the time David was first anointed king of Israel in 1 Samuel 16 to the time he actually assumes the throne in 2 Samuel, 15 to 16 years go by? 
15 to 16 years hiding out in caves, 15 to 16 years uh, dodging the deranged spears coming from his employer Saul, 15 to 16 years writing lament psalms, 15 to 16 years feigning madness in towns like Gath, and finally 15 to 16 years later, God says, now you're ready. Patience. The only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. Patience. As we come to our text, you need to understand that what differentiates James's epistle from every other epistle is if you studied it in the original language Greek, one of the things that would strike you about James's epistle is the frequency of a particular kind of Greek verb that he uses. It is an imperative. An imperative is simply a command. More than any other epistle, James has one command after another command after another command after another command. In fact, the whole epistle begins with a command when he says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. Now our text, verse 7, look at it with me, opens up with a command. He commands, be patient. He's not giving us tweetable advice to consider. He's not recommending, he's not suggesting, he's not running it by us for us to ponder. He's saying, I am commanding you, be patient. That Greek word translated as two English words, be patient, it's one word in the Greek. It is the Greek word makrothumos, makrothumos, makrothumos. It's a compound word with macro meaning long, thumos, from which we get the English word thermometer from, this temperature we use to measure heat. Thumos means anger. So literally, makrothumos translated be patient. It literally means to be long towards anger. It was D.A. Carson, the venerable scholar, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School here in Deerfield, Illinois, who wrote in his wonderful book, Scandalous, he says these words, the reason why we Christians never pray for patience is because we are theologically astute and sophisticated enough to realize that implicit in the very request for patience is another request, and that is God put me in something I do not like. You don't learn patience in air-conditioned cushion chair environments. You don't learn patience when the career is going well. You don't learn patience when those children just happen to be compliant. You don't learn patience when there's nothing wrong with your body. You don't learn patience when everything's going well with the marriage. You don't learn patience in seasons of prosperity. In fact, you should understand prosperity is a horrible teacher. You only learn patience when you wake up one day and there's a lump on your breast. Your mind is racing. You're waiting on the test results. You only learn patience when you assumed when you said, I do, you could get pregnant whenever you wanted to. And here you are a decade or so later dealing with a barren womb and a broken heart. Oh, and just to pour a little salt in it, here you are coming to church, paying your tithes, waiting on God while the crackhead down the street around the corner is at Planned Parenthood for the third or fourth time. Patience. You only learn patience when once again you have to wear another one of those hideous bridesmaid dresses. And you're standing there going, and she ain't even as cute as me. <laughs> I'm not saying, single people, that, that marriage is the end zone. You should know that while there's single people wanting to be married, there's married people wanting to be single. <laughs> and on that subject there, there are times when you only learn patience when you are Paradoxically lonely and married. Yes. Amen. 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 <laughs> it's not 
gonna, gonna deal with that. We, we're gonna let the Holy Spirit just. Amen. Our family only learned patience when my son Miles, who's here, had to spend five years at St. Jude's Children's Hospital with a rare blood disorder, praying daily scriptures over him, waiting on God. You keep inhaling and exhaling. You will find yourself at times in God's proverbial crock pot. And God says, you're going to have to trust me and sit there and be patient. Well, 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 Pastor, I, I understand that. I, I, I get that. But, but I feel like right now the message is very ethereal. You're kind of way up in the clouds. I need something practical. Exactly what does patience look like? You ask good questions at 1.35 on Sunday afternoons. James says, if you want to know what patience looks like, he says, look to the farmer. Now, I love this. Because no farmer goes to his barren field looks at the barren field, then up at God, then back at the field, then back up at God, and says, God, in the name of Jesus, I command corn. <laughs> Waiting on you, God, corn, in the name of Jesus. It's not what the farmer does. This is, a, this is James's analogy. You know what the farmer does. He goes to the barren field and he plows and he plows and he plows and he cultivates and he cultivates and he cultivates and he sows and he sows and he sows and he tends and he tends and he tends. Back breaking work, sweat pouring down his or her face from sun up to sundown, day in to day out, week in to week out. But he does all that knowing unless God sends the rain. So that the farmer teaches us, patience is never passive resignation. It is active waiting. It is me doing all that I can. It is me doing my something, waiting on God to add his something to my something, and now we've got something. This is the Apostle Paul. Much of Paul's ministry happens from a place he cannot change, from his own crock pot. It's called jail. When Paul gets to jail, he does not throw a pity party. Paul gets to jail and he says, hey, do you have a pen and a piece of paper? There's some churches I'd love to write. He can't change the situation, but he writes and he writes and he writes. You read these letters, we see something else he does while in this situation. In each of these letters, he says, I'm praying for you. He writes and he prays and he writes and he prays and he writes and he prays. And I love this one. Writing to the Philippians, he says, thank you all so much for praying for me. But I actually want you to know that since I've been in jail, the gospel has gone forth throughout the whole praetorian guard. The praetorian guard, they were individuals who were chained on either side of him. And it dawned on Paul one day, hey, I'm not going anywhere. Neither are you. We're stuck together. So I'm going to talk to you about Jesus and talk to you about Jesus. You rotate off. Two more guards come on. Rotate. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus to the point where the gospel has gone forth. What this demands is that at some point you stop throwing the pity party. Should you cry? Absolutely. There have been times my wife and I bawled our eyes out. There's times for frustration, but at some point, it's got to dawn on you, I'm here. I'm in it. This is where I am. Now, how can I make the most of it? Some years ago, I was pastoring in Memphis, and I had to fly up to Chicago, and I know it makes perfect sense with Chicago, which is due north of Memphis. For me to get to Chicago, I actually had to fly down south to Atlanta to change planes to go back up to Chicago. It makes total sense, I know. In Memphis, we actually had a saying that the way to hell has a layover in Atlanta. 
So here I am, changing planes, tight connection, um, get on the plane, headed to Chicago from Atlanta, and uh, I'm looking at my watch, I got to speak at this thing, and man, I'm flying in O'Hare, I know it's going to be, it's at 6 o'clock that night, which is right at the height of traffic, and I, it, we're, we're running late, running late, running late, and God bless the pilot's heart, but when we get to Chicago's airspace, he decides to give us an unsolicited tour of Chicago, bless his heart, man, this pilot kept going around, and around, And around, and as we're doing laps around the city of Chicago, my blood pressure is rising. I'm like, won't this man land the plane? In fact, I kind of muttered, I wish he would land the plane. And the guy across the aisle from me, I should never forget, he goes, well, actually, we're what's called in aeronautical terms a holding pattern. I'm like, who are you? I used to work for the FAA, he's telling me. And we're in something called a holding pattern. And the idea of a holding pattern is uh, there's a group of people in a tower who who sit up high and look down low. They see what we can't see. They have access to information we don't have. In fact, he says, Brian, you ought to be thankful because if they actually landed the plane on your timetable, we'd all be dead. Ever been in a holding pattern? You're just going around and around and around. God, I'm ready for you to land the plane. You need to understand God sits up high and looks down low. He sees what we can't see. He has access to information we don't have. And praise God, he does not operate on our timetable. If he did, we would be wrecked. Oh, and I love this. James says, oh, by the way, when you're in your holding pattern, do not Grumble. (laughs) He's writing to a group of ethnic Jews who have since converted to Christianity. And I promise you, when these ethnic Jews hear the word grumble, the first thing they think about are their foreparents who left Egypt through the Exodus event. And what was supposed to be a six-week journey from Egypt to the promised land turned into a 40-year debacle where they were in a holding pattern doing laps around Mount Sinai, around and around and around. And, 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 and why is that? Murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. And God's just kind of sitting up there going, you know what? You're supposed to be there uh, 39 years and 46 weeks ago. But because you murmur, grumble, and complain, I'm just going to kind of elongate your holding pattern. I wonder for how many of us that's true. God said, look, man, look, daughter, you were supposed to be there. But you're murmuring and grumbling and complaining. And that, why is that so offensive to God? The same reason why when children murmur, grumble, and complain, it is offensive to parents. Because from fundamentally, what grumbling and complaining says, I know better. I know better. Grumbling unleashes a vicious assault on the sovereignty of God. By the way, let, 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 me, let, me just, let me just take a riff, a little jazz riff right quick. Pastor Rich and I have not talked about this at all. But let me just, if I had a sofa, I'd just lay on it real quick as a pastor. If there's one area church folk have the corner mark, uh, 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 have a monopoly on, it's in the area of grumbling and complaining. <laughs> murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. And here's what, here's what kills me. Murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. Back next Sunday. I want to go, you got options. <laughs> Trust me. I, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll write you a good letter of recommendation to these other churches. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, he recently, true story, he recently become the pastor of this church, youngest pastor in the history of this church. And um, I sat down with him three months in. He's supposed to be in his honeymoon period. I said, man, how's it going? He looked at me with a scowl on his face. He says, I need to be doing about 10 funerals. It'll be going really well. Murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. Oh, by the way, if that seems harsh, God actually did that to the children of Israel. So I want to talk to you seasoned saints. You're supposed to be in your patriarchal years. They're supposed to be young people knocking down your door to sit at the local McDonald's or diner to glean pearls of wisdom from you. 
And if that's not happening to you, it could be because the landscape of your life is bitter and cynical. Nobody wants to be around that. So some of you in-laws, you just need to relax. I can't believe. I can't believe they're not coming on the annual spring break trip. We, we always go to the beach, and on Wednesdays, we go down to the beach at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. We all wear white. We've got the photographer who takes that perfect picture, and that goes out as our, as our Christmas card. We always do that, but they're not coming this year. I can't believe it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Talk about first world problems. And singles, I just want to tell you, it ain't cute. Like, when I was single, to run upon a bitter, negative woman, I was never like, oh, I want to be with you. <laughs> Grumbling has never been sexy. It's never been cute. And you never want to be around it. Do not grumble. Let's go home on this. So, Pastor, I'm here. I'm in the crock pot. I'm in a situation I can't change. I'm dealing with the health crisis. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with unemployment. If one more person tells me I'm overqualified for the job, I'm going to lose my mind. I, I, I'm dealing with a bad relationship, a bad marriage. I'm dealing with a barren wound. What, 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 do I, what do I do? He says, here's what you do. Look to the prophets. I was telling the first service, my youngest son is a basketball beast. When he played in New York, he played on two um, all-city teams, started averaging about 20 points a game. He's on a great AAU team. I mean, we, I, again, we call him RP, my retirement plan. <laughs> if you walk into his bedroom, there's all these posters and fatheads. There's, there's Michael Jordan training up a child in the way he should go. There's Kobe Bryant, parenting fail. Um, there's Derrick Rose, there's LeBron James. And, and, and there's been times I've literally seen my, my son laying on his bed looking at these posters and fatheads. You can just see him gleaning inspiration. And he grabs his basketball, goes outside and shoots basket. He's, baskets. He's inspired. James says, listen. When it comes to patience, you've got some patience posters. They're called the prophets. There's Ezekiel. God says, e e Ezekiel, my people don't understand my patience with me. They keep leaving me. They keep wandering away. They, they, they keep going astray. And, and I want them to understand that I am I'm steadfast. I am immutable. I, I, I don't wander. I don't go astray from them. So here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. Strip down naked. Leave your loincloth on. Lay on your left side. How long, Ezekiel asks, for 390 days don't move because I don't move with my people. Patience. There's Hosea. God says to Hosea, my people just don't understand how much I love them, and yet they keep on cheating on me. They keep whoring after other gods. His word. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the other side of town. I want you to marry a prostitute. She's going to break your heart. Oh, and by the way, when she cheats on you, go back and get her the same way I go back and get you and my people when they cheat on me. Patience. We are here by the patience of God. He should have taken us out a long time ago. You are here today because God is patient. Then there's the number 23 of patience. There's the Michael Jordan of patience. His name is Job. He says, you've seen the steadfastness of Job. Here's Job, he goes to a funeral with 10 caskets, each casket holding one of his kids. He loses all of his money, all of his businesses. He's covered from head to toe with boils. His wife is chirping in his ear, curse God and die. And in Job 19, in the midst of all of this, hear the patience, he has the audacity to say, I know my Redeemer lives. 
This blesses me. Job didn't feel like saying that, and this is a truth to life. Hear me. When going through life's difficulties, Job teaches us, always let what you know trump how you feel. God is good even when he doesn't feel good. Patience. Finally, James says, you've seen the purpose of the Lord. I love that. There's a purpose to the crock pot. There's a purpose to the unemployment. There's a purpose to the barren womb. There's a purpose to the strained relationship. There is a purpose. Growing up, my mother had an annoying hobby. It's called cross-stitching. Anybody here ever cross-stitch? Cross-stitching involves taking a piece of fabric and weaving threads in and out of it. I I call this annoying because Mama would always sit on our blue sofa there in College Park, Georgia, and do this. And I would watch her do this sitting beneath her at her feet. You ever watch someone cross-stitch from the bottom up? It 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 makes no sense. All you see is dangling threads, no rhythm, no rhyme, no reason, sheer chaos. In fact, I I know I'm in Queens. I know you won't get this idiom, but but, but there were times watching Mama cross-stitch, I thought her cheese had slid off her cracker. I remember one day just going, Mama, 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 why are you doing this for hours? It makes no sense. I don't see what you're doing. It it, it seems like chaos and confusion. Mama, why do you do this? And she just smiled at me and patted the the seat next to her. And she said, son, sit down next to me. And when I sat down next to Mama, I, I, I no longer saw things from the bottom up, but now I saw it from the top down. And when I saw it from the top down, I saw rhythm and rhyme and beauty and what once looked like chaos and confusion was now something emerging as something completely beautiful. And now I realize mama was up to something. The problem with life is the problem of perspective. We see it from the bottom up. And there are times in which if you tell the truth, queens, it will feel as if God's cheese has slid off his cracker. We're in situations that make no sense. And God is saying, sit down next to me. And if you sat down next to me, you would see that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. If you sat down next to me, you would see that he who began the good work will be faithful to complete it. If you sat down next to me, you would see that God has a propensity like the great theologian Beyonce (laughs) to make lemonade out of lemons. God is up to something. By the way, in those five years of praying for my boy with his rare blood disease, every day praying, 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 and Miles and I would pray together for five years. January of 2015, we were there at St. Jude's, and the doctors ran a battery of tests all day long, and they came back with a confused look on their face. They said, we can't explain it, but his blood disease, which we said was incurable, is gone. And of all of my children, there is a strength and a vitality to Miles' faith that I don't think he'd have had he not spent five years in the crock pot. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just ponder? I I love the contemplative emphasis of this community. But I want to pray for those who who are saying, Pastor, this is a word in season right now for me because I feel like I'm in my own crock pot. I'd love to pray for you. Sometimes we hear the word of God. We, it's a great word, but it's, it's not where we're at. But sometimes we hear the word of God, and it's a right now word. 
If this was a right now word for you, you just feel like I'm in a situation where I'm, I'm just in the crock pot. I'd love to pray for you. Would you stand if you were saying this is a right now word for me? I, I want to I pray for you, uh, but I don't want to be the only one praying. I don't, I'm not the only one who has the Holy Spirit. If you are a child of God, saved by his grace, you have the Spirit inside of you. So I want you to feel freedom to join me in prayer. You might want to stretch a hand towards someone who's standing near you, or even you may want to feel the freedom to stand with them. Let's join together in praying. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are standing. God, I am finite, I am limited, I have no idea the exact reason why they're standing, but by their standing, they're saying, I am in the proverbial crock pot. I am dealing with irritation, frustration. Some are even saying, it just feels like I can't go another step. The heat has been turned up. Maybe they're weary, worn out, tired, fatigued. I pray several things over them. Number one, I pray that they would know that you know. Psalm 8 says, what is man that you are mindful of him? God, you are mindful of what they're going through. You are not surprised by their situation and circumstance. In fact, Jesus would say, not a single sparrow falls to the ground and you don't know about it. You know about it. But not only that, and this really blesses me, not only do you know, but the Bible says you actually care. Psalm 8 says, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You care about the tears. You, you care about the health crisis. You care about the marriage that's on life support. You care about the child that's out in the far country. You care about the battle with that addiction that just seems to constantly plague that person. You care about the financial situation. You, you care about the barren womb. You care about the prolonged season. You care, you care, you care. So we rebuke the enemy, the father of lies who would seek to whisper in our ears that you are an uncaring God that is not true. You care. You care. So uh, now, Lord God, your, your word gives me the permission to pray selfish prayers because your word says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. John 15 says, if I abide in you and your words abide in me, I can ask whatever I wish and it will be done for me. So here's what I'm asking. Open up the barren womb. Remove the cancer. Bring back the prodigal child. Breathe life into the marriage. Grant the job. Fill up the bank accounts with, with supernatural provision from on high. Move miraculously in situations. And while we wait for you to show up, give us the strength to wait. To be patient. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together. I want to, we're going to take communion together. I want to invite those who are going to be offering the bread and the cup to come forward around the room here. Jesus' love is the epitome of patient love. And the communion table is the place where we encounter the patience of God. The Latin root of the word patience is to suffer. No wonder it's so terrible. But we believe in Christianity something called the Paschal Mystery. That out of suffering comes new life. This is the mystery of the cross. That out of suffering, new life becomes a possibility. And so the communion... table points us 
to the cross and the patient love of Jesus. And so when you come forward, you're going to take bread, you're going to dip it in a cup. And essentially, what we're doing is not just some religious thing. What we want is the patience of God to so permeate our lives that we live patient, as patient people, so that God could do his work in us and through us. Take the bread, dip it in the cup, go back to your seat, and now lead us to take it together. I want to give us a moment of our own repentance before God. The reality is we have all been, at some point or another, impatient. This past week, we've all been, at one point or another, impatient in small areas and in big areas. And God says, I'm not done with you yet. And as you wait on me, I am transforming you. I am deepening you. I am preparing you for blessing. Wait. Close your eyes for a moment. Offer your own repentance to God. We are in the season of Lent in which the church places that much more attention to repentance, a way of turning away from our own way and turning to God. So offer your own repentance before God in a moment, and we'll pray a prayer of confession on the screen. But right where you're at, offer to the Lord all the areas that you've been impatient. And you're saying, Lord, I want to choose to follow in your way. this prayer of confession on the screen together before we come to the table. Together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own faults, in thought, in word, in deed, in what we have done, in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name forward, take the bread, dip it in the cup, go back to your seat, and I'll lead us to take it together. Corinthians 11 says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the people of God, let's all take together. team to come to my left. We end every service with a time of prayer because it's our way of saying that to live the Christian life requires the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. In the second service, Pastor Brian talked about forgiveness and at the end, the invitation was forgiveness is a miracle because you need the power of God to do it to live the kind of patient life he talked about today, it's a miracle. We need the power of God. This is not just about greater willpower. You can't will yourself to be patient in this way. You can't get up in the, I'm going to be, the kind of patience that the book of James writes about is a patience that only God can form in us as we offer ourselves to him. And one of the ways that God's power becomes available to us is by us doing the simple and humble act of receiving prayer. And when we receive prayer and offer ourselves for prayer, what we're saying is, Lord, I know it's not by power, nor by might, but by your spirit. And so our prayer team is here. Maybe there's an area of your life where you're having a hard time being patient. Maybe you've taken matters into your own hands, like we've learned with Abraham and Sarah in the past few weeks. 
Maybe God is inviting you over and over again to stay, even though it's painful, that he will give you grace for this moment. So out of this moment, new life would burst forth. And so our prayer team is here as long as we need to pray for you. You stay as long as you need to, especially if the Holy Spirit is working with you today. But as we close, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. If you're new to new life, we close every gathering like this because this is a posture of receiving. The world's posture is grasping. The world's posture is manipulation. The world's posture is controlling. The Christian's posture is open-handed receiving. And saying, Lord, I cannot, how can I give what I have not received? And so we position our lives, our hearts in this way so that we can receive an offer out of that place. And so with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to the patience of God. That God every day has been patient with you. And may you in turn be patient with God. And patient with those who cross your path. And may you experience the Pascal mystery of Jesus. That out of deep pain and suffering, new life becomes possible. I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the patient name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.